Thank you. Uh, welcome. Um, I want to just extend my gratitude to Elder Snow and Michelle um, opening us in a good way this morning. I am going to be using my notes. <laughs> um, I am really grateful for Thea, Jonah, Adriana for inviting me. And I just want to talk about my own entrepreneurship journey, which has also supported black women entrepreneurs. And I'm going to close with some equitable practices to support women in the workplace as well. Um, I bring many roles and identities that I'm carrying with me that shape my experiences, my own perspectives. And I want to just start with a land and ancestral acknowledgement. So I'm grateful that I am able to conduct this work here on Treaty 6 territory, Métis Region 4, um, home of the Nehia, Dene, Anishabe, Nakota Iska, and Nitsitapi people. Um, I participated in this workshop with Indigenous Insight last week. And Kwasananu asked us to consider how we could think about land acknowledgements as a way to ask for permission to use the land. And I've been really reflecting on that because how do I get that permission to advance on um, equitable entrepreneurship opportunities? I think that one of the ways we do that is we start to have conversations, we start to have dialogue. Um, we think about what it means to work in peace and solidarity alongside Indigenous people. Also, many of us come here as settlers, as immigrants, as newcomers in either this generation or generations past. And I want to acknowledge those of us who came here, particularly as a result of the transatlantic slave trade. I want to honor and pay tribute to my ancestors of African origin and descent. And when I put the land and ancestral acknowledgements together, I really consider what it means to be black or indigenous. What are some of those shared struggles? What are about like access to healthcare? Um, housing, um, our experiences within the justice system. How can we dismantle systemic discrimination? How can we learn from one another? How can we support and uplift one another? I believe that I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors. I like to ground everything that I, uh, all my speaking opportunities in that way. Um, I think that I've really rejected the status quo um, and that's because of what I've seen, um, the like, the mistreatment of black communities, and I think that my equity work is not really binary. It's rewarding, it's exhausting, it can be gratifying, it can be humbling. And really what I wanna do is contribute my gifts and knowledge. I wanna leave a positive uh, mark on the world for the future that follows me. This quote really embodies me. None of us can do everything, but we all have the responsibility to do something. I was never one to sit still. Um, I reflect on my own experiences of organizing, and it was uh, high school, it was Hurricane Katrina, and I knew that I wanted to do something. I remember when Kanye West was on MTV and he said, George W. Bush does not care about black people, and I wanted to do something, even though we had no connection to New Orleans. I'm gonna talk about some of the photos that I'm gonna share with you, but first I wanna talk about this post that I found last year. And it said that uh, searches for black owned businesses was down 7,000%. That's wild. Um, and that was since 2020. I think that what that made me reflect on is that it's a critical time now to ensure black economic mobility. While the post doesn't really speak about women entrepreneurship specifically, I've been reflecting on what black owned market did for women entrepreneurs here in the city and what we continue to do with Feed the Soul Dining Week. Uh, at Tamarack, we believe in local place-based solutions and that's really what black owned market Feed the Soul Dining Week does. It takes a local place-based solution to how we can look at our ecosystem, how we can support entrepreneurs. Even Michelle was um, mentioning talking about industry, with nonprofits, with the government, and that's what we did. We worked with the city of Edmonton we were funded through Edmonton Community Foundation, Africa Center, and we were supporting businesses, and we were also being supported by businesses. Through these efforts, through these local place-based solutions, we can reverse statistics that say that searches for black-owned businesses is down 7,000%. So now you're probably wondering about this picture. Um, this was taken at our one-year anniversary market for black-owned market. The market was formed in July of 2020, and it was with a group of five community members. We were really strangers. And what we wanted to do was uplift, build, and support black entrepreneurs. Um, many of these 
business owners that we were working with were women, about 80% of them. The beautiful smiling face you see is Salima Jaffa. And I think about people like Salima and that's why I do the work that I do um, in community. Black owned market, it's not an entity anymore, but I continue to do that work through Feed the Soul. So Salima uses her grandmother's cold pressed soap methods rooted in West Africa traditions. And I think that's really cool. And I think that's important because when you think about entrepreneurship, it's that um, entrepreneurs are trying to tell their story. They're selling their story to you. People buy stories and people buy Salima soaps. And I know that because I buy them and I love them. People like Salima, they're that constant reminder for me. They're that motivation of why I get up and I go to my nine to five job and then I turn around and do my, what I call my five to nine job of supporting black entrepreneurs. On top of having a full-time job, um, people like Salima are mothers. Um, we have to think about how we can create that safe space, that inclusive space, even in places like the Black-owned market. So how do we do that? We minimize barriers. At Black-owned market, we try to reduce financial barriers. So we try to make it as financially accessible as possible. We source funding to cover operational costs and we asked for like a nominal fee just to get a sense of commitment, make sure that the vendor is gonna show up to the market. We also asked on the application form if cost was a barrier. So if people indicated there is a barrier, then we would work with them. Was there a payment term that we could do? Um, was there a scholarship that needed to be provided? We didn't wanna turn people away because of cost. We were also child friendly. It's not ideal to have kids running around the market as their moms are trying to sell, but people like Salima, and maybe Salima wasn't one that approached me about this, but um, sometimes childcare fell through. They have small systems of support. They have to decide, am I not gonna go to the market or am I gonna take care of my family? And so we would just say, bring coloring sheets, try and have your kids like behind your booth, as long as they're not disturbing the guests. Could we have been more child-friendly? Probably, but we're also a group of volunteers and we're just doing our best. We also had a bursary program um, and that was, that was brought to us because of uh, funding from a sponsor. But one of the women entrepreneurs was able to, they bought new product and they're able to expand their product line because of that. They were able to innovate and they were able to grow. And we really just asked business owners to communicate what they were planning to do with the money, and we invested in the projects that we believed in. We also paid up front knowing that access to capital was limited, and we just asked for a receipt when they were done their project. I think this is something that everyone can do. My next point is targeted marketing campaigns, International Women's Day, Women's History Month. We took advantage of these opportunities to highlight the stories of the women entrepreneurs. We connected their brands, their faces, and their stories to the hearts and the wallets of consumers. And we used analytics. I think data is really important, but understanding our audience was really crucial to the entrepreneur success. We knew that our consumers were 18 to 45 year old women, um, they had disposable income, and they related to the entrepreneurs. They wanted the products that the entrepreneurs were selling. And this allowed us, when we were invited into different spaces, to assess if it was going to be something that the entrepreneurs would be successful in. We didn't want to say yes to everything. We wanted to place them in something that was beneficial. Lots of these learnings have informed my own practices, what I'm doing at Tamarack, what I'm doing with Feed the Soul Dining Week. And I'm just going to introduce Feed the Soul Dining Week. So this is a small cohort of businesses that participated in our media and PR event launch. Um, we launched February of this year. My business partner, Sarah, is sitting in the front and we will have a booth there. So if you have questions, feel free to come talk to us. Um, again, this started as a group of volunteers. What Dining Week is, it's a regional opportunity to promote the, food, the black food and beverage businesses across the city. So it models downtown Dining Week but instead of being a geographic area, um, we went citywide. We offer price fixed menus, so an appetizer or a dessert, a main and a beverage, but we also had to do retail bundles. So a bunch of products that um, like brick and mortar or maybe farmer's market stores would put together and they'd offer it at a discount. We didn't want to exclude people, that's the most important thing. How we started was 
our group of volunteers mapped out black food and beverage businesses across the city, and we found 80 of them. Um, they were caterers, retailers, food trucks, takeout uh, counters, and sit-down restaurants. This is actually something I find really wild, is that a group of volunteers has the most knowledge of the black food and beverage business landscape here in the city. And I ask myself, what happens if industry, what happens if nonprofit, what happens if the government invests in this? What could we do with this information? Where can we take it? So we supported over 15 Black-owned food and beverage businesses this year. Um, we started with no sponsorship, no seed money. I know that we we're starting to get expenses, like we wanted to get our domain, we wanted to register. Um, we registered in a trade name. And the team started asking, like, we don't have sponsorship, we didn't even have a sponsorship proposal, but these costs are coming in. Some things that people probably know happen, but I try to, like, play it off is I had many sleepless nights wondering, okay, Rochelle, how are you going to pull off this one? Um, somehow, we did it. Our primary sponsor, when I told them about Dining Week, they were like, no, we don't want to get involved in that. They wanted me to do a different project, and they asked me to present that. I didn't have other options, and I took a giant risk. I'm not saying that you should take these risks, but I did what I had to do. And I pitched Dining Week. I pitched the proposal I believed in. I told them that I was investing my time, my skills, my knowledge, and my team was behind me, and this is what we're doing. And I invited them to get in on the ground floor. Luckily, they bought it, and they sponsored our project. We were able to get funded, and we, were, we established ourselves, and we carved out a niche right here in the community. It was risky. Um, we, we gained other sponsors as well, but I'm really proud of that risk that we took. As an entrepreneur, I'm not going to lie, I can't tell you how to create a, the perfect business plan. I don't know the psychology behind marketing. My best friend's a marketing professor, and as much as she tells me, I don't know. I don't know how to write a perfect press release. I work a lot on my gut instincts. I've learned by immersion, by experience, by my fail forwards. I phoned a friend or two or three or four along the way. But I know what will work. And even when it doesn't work, I take a lesson from it. I've learned the language. And I've, I really reflect that black entrepreneurs, we don't have generational wealth. We don't have those mentors that can help us in our business endeavors. We're starting to learn. We're starting to see more black entrepreneurs. And we're creating a network but we really, there's not like that, laying, that level playing field that you see. So again, I like to reflect. I am a connector. So I called Sarah a few days ago and we were talking about, okay, how does Feed the Soul Dining Week support women entrepreneurs specifically? And I really thought of some of the principles. So we really focused on relationship building. I also see Bernie in the back and Bernie was with us during this time as well. Um, but relationship building, we went and connected with all the storefront businesses that we could. We connected with the staff, the owners. People didn't know us. We didn't have a, a concept that they could see and like get on board with. So we were asking them to just put their trust in us, and that took time. We called the, the caterers. We called the markets. We also operated from a place of trust. So when business owners were like, this menu that you want doesn't work. It doesn't work for my business. I know we first we wanted to like stick to a certain dollar frame and our price fix menus kind of ranged based on what worked for the business. The retail bundles, if we had stuck to this like appetizer main course dessert model, we wouldn't have got the brick and mortar stores as well. We wouldn't have been able to work with Layered by Rissa or Mojo Jojo Pickles, Traveling Dishes or Olympia Ethiopian. Also, on the right-hand side is Amelia, and she operates the Hive Urban Community Agriculture. It's like a beekeeping farm. She's a beekeeper. She wasn't in Dining Week, but we wanted to put a spotlight on another black woman entrepreneur, and so she brought her raw honeycomb and was at our media event as well. We're also flexible. Um, we try to put our gifts and knowledge into everything that we do. So 
One of the women entrepreneurs, she didn't have the background to update her website. She couldn't get her dining week special on the store. There was no way for customers to actually order her dining week special. So what did we do? We hosted it on our website. We sometimes feel like we bend over backwards, but what we're doing is we're just doing our best to make sure that everybody is included, everyone's welcome, and everyone feels valued. When Sarah and I reflected on some of the other things that we did for women entrepreneurs, we thought about the media coverage or a videography project that we did. We really, um, what we did was we, we set people up for success in these first time experiences. So prepping them with um, speaking notes, talking about what they can expect when they get to the set, um, talking about their appearance, like everything from like, make sure your fingernails are clean to how your hair is tied back what you're wearing. Also, walking through some of our uh, businesses, they'd never been on TV, but they're doing live cooking segments. So how do you take a three hour pot of curry into a 10 minute cooking segment? Just doing everything that we could, coaching them when we were on the videography project, making sure the videographers were like filming them in the best light as well. We had um, two and a half caterers, and I say half because Cafe Caribbean has a storefront, but they started as a caterer and they continue to operate catering business. Um, but they were at our media and VIP event. Before we even had our dining week start, they were reporting that they were getting a surge in orders for Black History Month. So we were already having that impact. We were also child accommodating. Again, an entrepreneur had childcare and we were going to film at their location. We could have said no, we could have rescheduled, but instead we had kids on set and that's okay, we worked around it. And another important thing that we did is we were flexible again. We offered multiple times for meetings. We recognized that um, food businesses have a dinner rush and so having a meeting at 6 p.m. when it's convenient for us isn't convenient for them. So we offered multiple times one of our orientations was at 9 p.m. at night. It allows mothers to put their kids to bed as well. Before Dining Week was a public concept, I was already starting to work with some black food and beverage businesses. So I worked with Mojo Jojo Pickles and Vitality Teas. Blue Cross reached out and they had a box and they wanted it to be food themed and they asked if I knew of any businesses that could contribute. Small actions like that matter. Blue Cross is a large entity. They have thousands of staff. Even if you think of you can support 10, like you have 10 staff and you can buy one product, like a jar of jam or something. It really has a huge impact on women entrepreneurs. Both of those business owners reached out to me this summer asking if I had corporate clients. And I know that that helped keep them um, in the green, their books in the black, I guess, um, last year. So they were hoping that we had more corporate clients for this year. This is a term field catalyst. I learned this when I started at Tamarack and I will be using my notes because it's something I'm still like getting comfortable with. But what Tamarack does is we build the capacity of change makers across diverse sectors and we bring them together to solve those major um, issues, building youth futures, climate transitions, building belonging, ending poverty. So social innovation generation defines field catalysts as connecting fragmented players in a given area of work to create an organized industry around an issue or challenge so that the field can operate more effectively and efficiently and to tease out best practices and improve outcomes. And what field catalysts, the role that they play is that they bring attention and legitimacy to a particular issue. They increase the exchange of theory and practice. I'm a practitioner, I have an undergrad, I don't use academic lingo. I don't immerse myself in academic research, but I, I work from a framework of my lived experience from what I, I gain in the field. Um, I also think that field catalysts identify and disseminate promising practices. They reduce inefficiencies, but they also allow for collaborations to happen that wouldn't have formed organically. And as I learned about field catalysts, I was like, wow, that's what I do. That's really cool. There's a name for that. So. I work from a, com a community informed model. I try to represent the voices of the entrepreneurs and the collectives that I formed. And I also work top down through some of the decision making seats um, that I hold. A huge lesson as I think about the, wor the work of a field catalyst is you're working in an ecosystem and it's really important that you 
learn about the roles that you can have within the ecosystem. We all have different roles to play. We all show up differently. I know there's a, a session later on ecosystem funding, so I encourage you to take part in that one. Through Black Owned Market, uh, I connected and supported 125 entrepreneurs. And through Feed, Feed the Soul Dining Week, we've worked intimately with over 15 of those businesses um, throughout this year. Um, layered by Rissa, for instance, she sold out her first pop-up um, during Dining Week that we helped arrange. And it was really a collaboration between the market and some of the connections we had formed there, as well as what we were doing with Dining Week. I also think of the business owners. I remember our, I was walking upstairs with a tub of Dining Week stuff, and I live on a fourth floor walk-up. And I got a phone call, and I was like, I don't want to talk to these, these business owners anymore. I need a break. But I picked up the phone, and I'm really glad I did, because that business owner said that we were a divine in intervention sent by God to save his business. We had that much of an impact, this group of volunteers. I think one of the most rewarding things about being a field catalyst is when you're not actually involved, but you see um, some of the work happening and starting to impact other people. So this summer, I took a step back from my own projects, and I was... I worked on some projects like as people brought me on as like a paid staff, but I saw K-Day's work with Pentrail Entertainment and Cocktails and Jerk Festival. Last year, um, K-Day's had reached out and Black Owned Market was there. So it was kind of sad that we weren't able to be at K-Day's this year, but being able to see the biggest black representation that I've ever seen at K-Day's and knowing that you, were, you contributed to opening that door of opportunity, that's really huge. I also think about the Mayor's Business Advisory Council. Um, that's part of my work as a field catalyst. Marcella's smiling at me, you see her in the picture. <laughs> yeah, right? I actually was gonna wear the shirt in the video and I was like, I better not do that. Um, I sometimes feel like a broken record at this table. I'm always saying that we need to center equity. I'm always telling them that the model that they're talking about doesn't work for the entrepreneurs I work with. I feel like when we think about the business like decision-making tables, we tend to make it too complex. The other thing that I do is I think about small businesses. I think about solo entrepreneurs like my neighbor, Hideout Distro, and they're just struggling. They wanna keep their doors open. They don't have time to like fill out forms and applications or advocate for themselves. So what processes, what language, how can we make um, the whole process less complicated? How can we make a commitment, upfront costs? How can we mitigate those barriers? There's also some cool connections from being at this table. So Sikander runs Moskers Film Fest and he wanted black Muslim vendors. Um, we didn't really have any, but I had a, a vendor manager at the time and he went and sourced out some black um, entrepreneurs and we were able to put them into their market. Also Hubert from Trustbix. He's working on an equity project and I've shared some best practices on EDI surveying with him. Um, the Mayor's Business Advisory Council and their team have also supported Feed the Soul. So when they found out about Dining Week, they sourced one of the businesses and brought in catering for one of our meetings. And I was able to introduce the 15 other businesses we were supporting to this network, um, this group of change makers, this group of business owners. And I don't know, I hope that they're thinking about where they're taking their clients for meetings and maybe supporting some of these entrepreneurs. This slide, I do have permission to present it from Innovate Calgary. I saw it a few weeks ago. Um, but I just think it's really cool because there's groups out there that are studying entrepreneurs. Um, this one has black entrepreneurs, rural innovators, BIPOC entrepreneurs and innovators, Hispanic entrepreneurs. It also has some shared um, barriers that they're finding across these sectors limited access to funding, importance of representation, credibility. I think that if you are trying to understand what are those barriers that different identity groups are facing, reach out to Innovate Calgary, find out what they're learning, what they're doing. Also, we believe in an asset-based um, approach at Tamarack, and so if you have gifts that you can contribute, I would also encourage you to reach out and like, see how you can plug into their ecosystem. I also want to talk about the State of Black Entrepreneurs Report that was published by the Africa Center. It's really groundbreaking research. Um, it 
will address some of the economic opportunities and uh, entrepreneurial inequities. We've never had a report like this, so the work they're doing is really pivotal and crucial. Um, Alberta has the third largest uh, growing black demographic um, across Canada, and it's really young. We're taking up roles in the tech sector and the startup sector. And so knowing about some of these challenges will be really helpful in, as you look at the entrepreneurial landscape. Uh, some of the challenges that people had initially and continue to experience in their journeys include lack of availability of credit or loans and the cost of labor. I think the report's like 20 pages. I went through it, um, lots of graphs, so it's like not too heavy on the reading, but I really encourage you to look at what they're doing. And I'm going to close just with some practices about how we can make the workplaces more inclusive for women. And I think we could do this just in spaces that we have in general. So have flexible work policies. During the pandemic, we saw remote work, hybrid work. Those really allows people to attend to caregiving needs. Um, at Tamarack, we have care days and we have a broad definition. It's if we're personally, we're ill. If our family, pets, loved ones are ill. Um, or I've seen them used in like non-traditional ways. Um, some staff recently used them to attend a global strike action day. Offer parental leave. I still see people that have maternity leave in their HR policies, and a simple language shift is really huge. Parenting is a shared responsibility, and so having parental leave allows the woman to actually be in the workplace if that's what works best for their family. Have lactation rooms. I'd also off, um, add faith spaces and respecting cultural gender norms in those faith spaces. Having employee resource groups, groups that can advocate for the needs of women in the workplace, but also that organizations can tap into. And I've added another one that's not on the slide, but um, appearance and dress code policies. We need to stop policing women's bodies and we need to give them their right to express themselves. So I hope that you have some ideas about why it's important to support women entrepreneurs, um, learn about my own journey as a woman entrepreneur as well, and consider what your role is within the ecosystem. What are those ways that you can support, whether it's buying products and supporting the businesses or bringing some of the women entrepreneurs into the work that you're doing. And I hope that the last slide can help you think about how you can create those safe and inclusive spaces. We heard Saint talk about how that black owned market was the first space where she felt really included. And so, yeah, I would encourage you to just think about what role you're gonna take up. And thanks so much for having me.